Bob, I come from a Baptist background and we emphasize evangelism and there are many different methods of presenting the gospel to people. Um, sometimes we do appeals to saying the sinner's prayer. Sometimes we ask people to raise their hand or come to the front. Um, all of those things are involved in the presentation of the gospel. But what is the best way to present the gospel? Well, that's a good question. When you're talking, the, the, all the things you were talking about were what we might think of as the close, which, or the invitation which I don't like the concept of a close or an invitation because you don't find it anywhere in the scriptures. But let me begin there and then we can go back and talk about some of the things that would precede this. But since you've started with that, let, let me start there. And what I would say is we don't find any invitations of any kind. The closest we get is in John eleven twenty six, 26, where Jesus says to Martha, do you believe this? That's it. That's the closest we get. Um, and so the idea of praying some sinner's prayer, walking an aisle, raising your hand, none of that's done. Giving your life to Christ, no, none of that. The soul condition is believing in Jesus. John 3.16, John 5.24, John 6.35, Ephesians 2.8 and 9, and on and on and on. It's just simply believing in Jesus. So the goal of our evangelism must be to get them to see Jesus, right? Just like the serpent was lifted up in the Old Testament, the bronze serpent, so that whoever saw the serpent would live. So we lift up Jesus so that whoever sees him will live. And the lifting up of Jesus is pointing out what in the scriptures is called the promise of life or the message of life. Jesus promises everlasting life to the one who believes in him. So when you get down to the bottom line, what a person must do, it's not inviting Jesus into your heart or praying some prayer. It's believing in him. Now, the real question becomes, what does it take to get a person to believe that, right? In other words, very few people, if you just came up to them and said, Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but has everlasting life. If they've never heard a word about Jesus, they'd go, who's Jesus? Why should I believe him? Why would this be true, right? Now, we happen to live in a quote-unquote Christian land. So almost everybody's heard of Christmas and Easter and the empty tomb, right? Good Friday, or used to be called Black Friday, the resurrection. They've heard all these things. So that we have a certain advantage in that, you know, some of these people may well have heard that Jesus shed his blood for us on the cross. That he's already paid the full and complete payment for all our sins. He rose bodily from the dead. And that because he died on the cross, he took away our sins. But the truth is, the bottom line where we're going with that, that is the apologetic or the evidence that Jesus is telling the truth when he says, he who believes in me has everlasting life. So that's where we're trying to get people, is to believe in Jesus for everlasting life. And the interesting thing is, in the Gospel of John, Jesus really doesn't invite belief exactly. He just makes declarative statements. He who believes in me has everlasting life. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but has everlasting life, right? I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. John 6, 35, etc. He makes a bunch of declarative statements. Now, implicitly, they're invitations to believe. But the point is, we just present the truth and leave the results to God. The Holy Spirit will work in people's hearts. And so, in my view, we share Christ with people. We don't share ourselves. We don't call them to change their lives. We call them to believe in Jesus. Maybe I can make one final point related to this. I have a little pet peeve. A lot of people use the, the approach that you're a sinner separated from God. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And if you believe he died on the cross for your sins, then it'll count for you. And then you can be born again. I, I don't agree with that. The truth is, you and I are sinners. 
But our sins don't separate us from God because of the cross. The good news is when Jesus died on the cross, he took away the sins, not only of believers, but unbelievers. He took away the sins of the world, John 1, And he also is a propitiation, not only for our sins, but for the whole world, 1 John 2, 2, unlimited atonement. He died for everybody. So the good news is that we can tell people when we're talking to them, you don't have to clean up your life. You don't have to deal with your sins. Jesus already dealt with your sins. Lewis Berry Chafer, the founder of Dallas Seminary, where I went, used to say, because of the cross and the blood of Christ, people no longer have a sin problem, S-I-N. They now have a son problem, S-O-N. What do you do with the Son of God? Do you believe in him for the life that he promises or not? That's the issue. 